Hi, you're listening to Marsha Pally and conversations I'm having with people about the criteria we should use to design and implement our economic and political policies. What should be our basic framework for determining public policy? These conversations are based on ideas from a book of mine, Commonwealth and Covenant, Economics, Politics, and Theologies of Relationality, because we're looking specifically at relationality as this framework for policy. Relationality includes both the individual person and the relations and contexts that he or she is in. Relationality is developed in many of our philosophical traditions and also in several theological traditions. Whether you think theologies are the word of the divine or an illuminating metaphor, in both cases they offer us much about how the world and people work and so about the policies that will lead to the greatest human flourishing. Please join us in this series of conversations. Commonwealth and Covenant was published by Erdman's Press in 2016. You can follow me at marshapally.com or search for me on Facebook and Twitter. Biologist Darcy and Narvaez comes to the conclusion that morality emanates from aspects of this evolvement and its many downstream psychological, social, and cultural environmental effects. Since we only individuate in community, I suspect moral decision making will include reward estimations based on benefit not only to the self but to the group. Perhaps the origin of things like direct and indirect reciprocity and reputational altruism. Um, what he's saying at the very end, and then I'm going to pass around some of Darcy and Nar uh, Narvaez's observations. What he's saying at the end is that because we survive in groups, that is the way mammals and actually many other creatures have evolved. Because we survive in groups, <clears throat> We are wired to make decisions that benefit the self and the group. Human babies are born in a particularly unformed state. It has to do with we have large brains and the babies need to be born earlier in the gestational period than other mammals and certainly other kinds of creatures. And there's a great deal of interaction with the um, babies neurological and chemical and genetic material that incur, occurs in utero and then a great deal that continues to develop in the first several years of life. And that is the um, basis of our interaction. Our foundational de uh, development is based on our interaction with others. And of course we can focus on the parents the siblings, the family. But remember that the things that affect those parents may come from far away from the family. The, amount, the economic system that they're in, the amount of nutrition that the child has or that the mother has or that the other siblings have, the amount of st um, stress uh, that the family or community is under may come from circumstances far away from that family. They may come from political circumstances, certain economic decisions, global trade agreements, scarcity that is organized, that uh, results from certain global economic situations. Um, what about the availability of, of, uh, of interaction itself? How isolated is this child or this family? And again, um, importantly, how much pressure and stress are the people in the child's environment under? Um, what kind of nutrition is available? All of these things affect the primal environment of every single person that develops. There's a book of Charles Durber, A Pursuit of Attention, and he said that people seek groups um, also because of narcissism. They want to um, uh, 
people cannot love or we cannot love ourselves just because um, but the amount of self-love we can afford depends on our income of attention by others. So, yeah, that's mm -hmm. okay. If human flourishing is our aim, we must consider that the activity of explaining why things are as they are is intrinsically like the activity of determining what the good is, and in particular, how human beings should live. In other words, determining the good, in order to determine the good, we have to figure out how we are. Yeah? And we talked about that last week. The reason why I'm talking about separability and situatedness is not to be nice or to be politically correct. It's because I think that's how we are. And if we are going to create conditions of the good and human flourishing, then we have to begin with how we are. To approach eudaimonia or human flourishing, one must have a concept of human nature, a realization of what constitutes a normal baseline, and an understanding of, what, of where humans are. And where is that? Embedded in a cooperating natural world. She continues, no individual develops alone. Development always takes place in the setting of relationship. First dyadic, that's two like mommy baby, and then polyadic, child and everybody else. Being knows itself only in relation to others. Now remember, she's a biologist. She's not a theologian or a philosopher. Emerging independently around the world, small band hunter-gatherers, 95% uh, uh, <clears throat> of human evolution, <clears throat> that, um, and values, ha had values, sorry, that those that sounded like those early Christians, generosity, sharing, egalitarianism. And it is striking how peaceful the small band hunter-gatherers tended to be. Now, this is what she notices about the cur our current situation in the modern West. Uh, she notices that societal trust has deteriorated at all ages in the last half of the 20th century. Each of these, by the way, is accompanied by a good deal of research. I'm just excerpting so we um, have a manageable thing here. Number two, participation in social leisure groups has decreased, as has the average number of confidants individuals have. Confidants, people you rely on and people you trust. Three, more than 50% of adults are single, and single adult households have become the most common type of household. Four, avoidant attachment. That means you have a suspicion of attaching, you avoid attaching. In college students, and perhaps narcissism in this population as well, has been trending upward for decades and has increased significantly in the past decade. Darwin proposed that the moral sense, the moral sense, initially arose from the parental and social instincts that evolved in mammals. We get our morality from our interaction with our parents and societies, and now we're going to go more into the um, biology. Structures and personalities built in childhood were brought, are brought into adulthood as default assumptions for the lifescape. So what you learn as a child forms your assumptions, but also, as we'll see, your actual neurochemical wiring and which genes get turned on and which don't, and which neurological pathways are facilitated and which are not. And you carry these into adult, adulthood as the default way that you experience the world. Culture is also influential. The culture in which one is immersed influences how one behaves towards others on all levels. So it's not only your parents, of course it is importantly your parents and your families and your siblings and your local community, but also, as we have said, it's your culture, your cultural practices, and the uh, larger influences that affect your life to the extent that that is stressful, hostile, competitive, aggressive, that will inform the development of each person in that milieu, in that society. 
and serve to continue the competitiveness and the aggressiveness, right? So that you get a kind of generational spiral. Yeah, Christian. Um, I don't understand. This is a process in the whole life or just in the shows? Because uh, let's take people, for example, who come to university, for example, who come from a, um, how can I say, who are the first ones who study in the family, so they have a, they have a, um, um, let's say, interesting um, uh, break from their mm -hmm. social environment and family. Yeah, this is a process that is important in childhood, but continues. And again, uh, at the end of our list, I want to run through them. She herself says, oh, uh, she has an entire chapter at the end about changes that people make in adulthood. It's not true that we are locked in to whatever happens in the first two years of our life. It's influential. Mm -hmm. And she also notices that all these cultural things come into play as well. But it doesn't lock you in. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is actually why we study, right? So we can learn things as an adult so we're not locked into wherever we started, right? That we, we can read, we have intellects and imaginations, and we move from where we started. That's, um, so let's, um, let's see what she says about genes. I was yes? just wondering how she defines culture. Because um, I think culture is something, can be something very particular or very something um, I think here she means uh, the societal oh, mores, <laughs> values, assumptions, outlook, practices. She doesn't mean okay. opera. No, no, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. No, no, that's yeah. what I thought, but yeah. it always depends on opera. Yeah, she means opera too. That's right. She means opera too, but not only opera. Yes, okay. this kind of broad level of assumption. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's hear of, um, again. She is synthesizing. Um, genes are themselves inert, meaning they don't do anything. They do not act alone, but require an interactive context of environmental influence, maturation, and action. Just because we have a particular gene, and a particular gene's allele, doesn't mean that it will be turned on, or expressed, activated, and influence functioning. Environmental influences, external and internal. By internal, she means there are genes, but we have internal, it, it, that, it, that gene is influenced by hormones, enzymes, and other chemicals going through the body that are outside the genes. So, mm, environmental, environmental influences, external and internal, and the timing of those influences on genetic expression matter a great deal. The predominant view uh, that the beginning of life on Earth was marked by cooperative RNA molecules and proteins. Life was, so <clears throat> life did not begin with genes. Life began with cooperative RNA proteins and molecules. Life was cons constituted by biological cooperation, by cooperative communicating ensembles of protein and RNA molecules that <clears throat> were able to reproduce themselves. These systems were distinguished by connectedness. This is how life, it seems, began. None of the components was autonomous. Only cooperation could make things happen. Genes emerged much later and they are universally under the command of the cell. And the cell developed from these cooperating RNA molecules and proteins. Signals to genes can come from inside or outside the organism. Inside, again, the neurochemicals inside you, but the signals to genes themselves come from uh, interaction with the outside world. It can be chemical interaction, pollutants, but it's also actually affective and emotional interaction actually affect which genes work and how and what aspects of genes get turned on or not. Genetic variations account for less than 10% of variability in most complex behaviors. We, this, is, um, to, this last bit is to address the Dawkins idea that we are a, um, wired for competition. 
We humans share most of the same genes, and many of our genes are shared with other animals. So few genes are even available for competition between us. In fact, less than 1% of my genes are available for competing with yours. Here she talks about the safety ethic. Safety ethic is what your body produces, and even a baby's body, when it senses threat. Now that's very important to have in case you should be threatened. But there are problems that develop when one is threatened over and over again, and then the defenses against threat become the facilitated pathway. And then you're likely to return, uh, respond with defensiveness or aggression to many things in the world, even ones that aren't really threatening. So let's hear what she says. The safety ethic is a moniker for a set of moral mindsets that emerged from triggered autonomic responses to threat, resulting in general threat sensitivity, externalizing <clears throat> a combative morality, and here I note, here this is parallel to excessive separability. Um, a heightened threat sensitivity comes, uh, creates a combative morality, of course it would, you, if you're threatened over and over again, either as a child or even as an adult, you'll develop the reflexes to respond to threats. You'll be ready for threats. You'll be ready to defend yourself. Maybe even ready to be aggressive. Even recreate. Yeah, and you might, that's right, recreate or interpret events that are not threats as threats because you're facilitated now to interpret the world as a threatening place. You create situations to fight against it. Threat, you can create, yes, you, yes you can create or you can misinterpret, mm. right? Mm. So you say good morning and somebody says, good morning, I'm sorry, I'm in a rush. And then you start to think, aha, that person really doesn't like me. That person is, right, that person is planning. I knew that person was going to get me, right? Right, okay. Um, so threat sensitivity yields a combative morality, or if you internalize it, you can become very compliant. Yeah, you just, you're so afraid of threats, you just agree with whatever's going on, right? So there, you have too much situatedness and you lose your separability. They have uh, made studies on uh, children that were sexually abused that male turn into this combative morality and female, ter uh, the women, or when they're adults, turn into the more compliant. Uh, uh -huh. That um, yeah, there's either violence or or this compliance. Uh -huh. We'll see if she talks about. I think in this uh, here she doesn't talk about gender differences yet, but maybe next week there'll be another free uh, set of excerpts. <laughs> um, trauma or chronic stress can lead to habituated use of these primitive moral mindsets and related ideology. Chronic stress or trauma habituates this heightened threat sensitivity and you start to repeat it. Now, she's also considering that if you have societies or cultures that are under threat, now they can be under threat from war, they can be under threat from economic duress, they can be under threat from pollutants in the air, they can be under threat from political situations, etc. Um, now that these external situations are gonna affect the communities and the families and create environments for the next generation to respond to the world in a very threatened way and a very defensive and therefore aggressive way. So again, you can get an unhappy spiral from this environment. So she talks about two ways cultures can be set up, with either an emphasis on competition or on cooperation. In the natural world, I like this, cooperation is a thin icing on the thick cake of cooperation. The currently dominant competition story may be a natural output of the way we have been raising children and ourselves. Um, Lucas, I think this is particularly interesting for um, some of the points that you've brought up. Um, that 
in terms of evolutionary biology, competition is just a very thin layer on this big thick cake of cooperative evolution. But our present dominant story that the world is a competitive place may be the result of the way we, I think she, she or she means the modern West, has been raising our children and ourselves. And I like that she includes ourselves, that in some sense we are raising ourselves into a competitive, aggressive tendency. Yeah. But isn't this a circle? But we can ask um, why are the adults acting like that? And then we come to a. Yeah. That's, that's a very good question, and it's why I, I um, stress the modern West. Because cultures change, but cultures change slowly. But they change. And they change from internal and external factors. And uh, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about changes that occurred in early modernity. Um, with things that produced great advantages, increasing technology, control of the environment, better science, all of these produced great things, greater survival, longevity, better health, better nutrition, but they also had some downsides of, uh, that we discussed a little bit earlier, of the worldview that we are separate from others in the environment, but also physical separation as we became increasingly mobile. And over the last 500 years, Narvaez and many others are suggesting that the modern West has shifted towards an, an excessive separability, and it's having some negative effects. So if you want to say, why is the parents, and their parents, and their parents, and their parents, when you start to get back into the 16th century, you'll, or the 17th century, you'll, um, you may find that what we consider the way things are now weren't the way things were then, but that cultures, um, change slowly but inevitably, and that modern Western culture changed slowly over the last 500 years towards an emphasis on a kind of, on a kind of separability um, and therefore a kind of me for myself, a competitiveness and fear that, well, if me, if I'm for myself, then you must be for yourself and I have to watch out for you, and there we get competitive aggression. Last week, that was um, Thomas Hobbes' di um, diagnosis, that the fear that other people are going to grab from you creates um, competitive aggression. Now, not <laughs> all societies are um, feeding off of that fear as much as others. Not all societies are the same, and not all periods of time are the same. So. Your question is, is very insightful. If we go back and we go back, we will start to see that things in the past in history weren't necessarily the way they are today. And things that we consider the status quo or just the way things are, weren't. We are living at a particular historical time with um, certain advantages and certain disadvantages. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, when we talk about this uh, response, to threat, for example, do we talk about individuals or do we, or do we talk about uh, communities or societies? And so this is uh, this important difference. Yeah, um, I think Narvaez is is, uh, is uh, has both in mind as follows: that these are actually synergistically interactive because if you have a community that sees the world as a threatening place. It's going to have defensive and aggressive practices, not only war, but within its own social practice and the things that people do every day to deal with the worldview of incessant threat. And that's going to include its child rearing practices. So it will affect individual children as they are born and they are as they are acculturated into a society that is threat sensitive. 
or hostility sensitive. Yeah. But if you have societies that are less threat sensitive, that will affect all social practices, including child rearing practices. And so those children will be acculturated into a less threat sensitive, competitive, aggressive um, way of being. So they're not they're not separate. Your question is, is on target. The cultural way of being is not separate from the child-rearing practices of the culture that produces individuals who participate in the culture. Yeah? So to finish her up, um, humans are born only minimally formed and are highly impacted by postnatal events. Developmental sequences and maturation assume an expectable environment. Cultural inheritance, this is to your question, encompasses multiple levels of effects, including beliefs about human nature and human purpose and what it means to be a good person. Socially transmitted symbolic inheritance, shared understandings and beliefs that influence behavior or culture may be one of the most influential inheritances that can be more or less adapted. So the culture, and the socially transmitted information is one of the most important because all people in that society are acculturated to these, this, uh, society, this way of looking at the world and it will affect, as we've just said, all of their conduct, including their child rearing and then how, what the next generation is being born into. In short, whom a person becomes is a co-construction of genes, gene expression from environmental effects, developmental plasticity, that means that the baby is born unformed and a lot of a baby development happens in interaction, plasticity is flexibility. The ecological and cultural surroundings, gifts of evolution, and the nature of care received. Um, we are at time, so I want to skip down to the bottom. But do you want to read the rest, or should we skip down to the bottom? Hmm? We read it ourselves, and we skip to the bottom. Yes, yeah. okay. Now, this goes to whether or not we should all be depressed. <laughs> wow. Once self-conscious autonomy is possible, in other words, in the older child or the adult, no matter what the past, an individual has the opportunity to remake the self intentionally. This gift of autopoiesis or self-creation may represent the greatest biology of freedom. Um, so I um, gave this handout from Darcia Narvaez as well as from Gregory Friccione to supplement our ontological view that we are indeed separability amid situatedness. And when we violate that, we get severe difficulties. And we get them, interestingly, at the physical and biological level, at the level of our neurochemical wiring that affects, as Christians pointed out, the way groups behave societies behave, subgroups, sub subgroups, small families, but also larger groups. And this is in some sense what we mean by cultural tendencies. And here I want to close on this thought. Everybody, as I've said many times in the last two weeks, everybody is of course unique. When we talk about culture, we don't mean everybody in the culture behaves exactly the same way. In fact, I would say nobody behaves exactly the same way. But there are tendencies within sub, 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 subgroups, then subgroups, then groups, there are, and then nation, there are cultural tendencies. And these tendencies evolve over time and are different from place to place. So the culture you're in, and the subculture, and the sub, subculture, and the sub, sub, subculture are going to affect, of course, to some extent, that the, and, biologically affect um, the kind of person you develop into. And it's the claim of 
um, all the biologists and psychologists and brain science people um, that Narvaez and many others have cited and the claim of the ontology that I've d discussed today, that we are, in some sense, a species of separability and situatedness. And if you get into a historical moment or a place where that is violated, you will have some difficulties because you're violating the setup.